All right, folks, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered for a Wednesday, February 27, 2019. Donald Trump's lawyer destroys the orange one and his lies at a public hearing on Capitol Hill. Trump's racism, a key subject throughout the hearing. All oh, wait till y'all see the video. All these members of Congress just jamming them up. And y'all know what's up. Why do Republicans can't handle these new sisters who are in Congress? Wait till we show y'all the video. NAACP President Derek Johnson is here to talk about how the NAACP has a new way to support them on Wall Street. 
will tell you about uh, this initiative. Also, a black woman will be the next mayor of Chicago, will be the second time in history an African-American is elected mayor of Chicago. We'll tell you about yesterday's vote in the Windy City. Also, we'll talk with the mother of Columbus, Ohio activist Amber Evans. It has been a month, folks, since she has been missing. Are the police looking hard enough for a mother? Reach out to us. We're going to have her on the show. In Virginia, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax got some good news this week. More people want him to stay in office rather than resign. Also, breaking news, the Washington Post is reporting that the wife of the governor of North of Virginia, Ralph Northern, y'all, she passed out some cotton to some black kids on a tour. What the hell is wrong with these people in Virginia? And today's crazy white woman is a Maryland state legislator. Wait till you hear her excuse for using the N-word. Lord, crazy white people. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin on the field trip. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. 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 Rolling with rolling now. Yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. Oh man, riveting testimony all day today on Capitol Hill in D.C. is Michael Cohen, the longtime lawyer and fixer for Donald Trump, uh, testified publicly. His was crazy. Don Michael Cohen is the first person who Robert Mueller has actually uh, interviewed as a major witness who has testified publicly about Donald Trump. It took place before the House House Committee on Government Oversight and Reform, led by Congressman Elijah Cummings. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, one, on one hand, you had Democrats who were sitting here listening to uh, Don, uh, Michael Cohen talk about uh, Donald Trump and his lying and underhand dealings. And you had the Republicans who were trying to say, uh, Michael Cohen's a liar. Well, so is Donald Trump. And what was crazy is, y'all, they couldn't even defend Donald Trump. They were just trying to say how Michael Cohen is just a straight-up liar. And so uh, we got lots of video we want to show for you. Uh, but uh, let's take a minute to listen to this uh, close confidant of Donald Trump. Tell us what was really going on during the 2016 presidential campaign. And, of course, y'all know I created the hashtag. We tried to tell you. We tried to tell you. Over time, I saw his true character revealed. Mr. Trump is an enigma. He is complicated, as am I. He is both good and bad, as do we all. But the bad far outweighs the good. And since taking office, he has become the worst version of himself. He is capable of behaving kindly, but he is not kind. He is capable of committing acts of generosity, but he is not generous. He is capable of being loyal, but he is fundamentally disloyal. Donald Trump is a man who ran for office to make his brand great, not to make our country great. He had no desire or intention to lead this nation, only to market himself and to build his wealth and power. Mr. Trump would often say, this campaign was going to be the greatest infomercial in political history. He never expected to win the primary. He never expected to win the general election. The campaign, for him, was always a marketing opportunity. And then, of course, we had to hear Michael Cohen talk about Trump being a bigot. Mr. Trump is a racist. The country has seen 
Mr. Trump court, white supremacists and bigots. You have heard him call poorer countries shitholes. His private, in private, he is even worse. He once asked me if I could name a country run by a black person that wasn't a shithole. This was when Barack Obama was president of the United States. And while we were once driving through a struggling neighborhood in Chicago, he commented that only black people could live that way. And he told me that black people would never vote for him because they were too stupid. And yet, I continued to work for him. Okay, now that was all kind of craziness happening in this hearing. But early on, one of the craziest things was seeing uh, Congressman Mark Meadows of North Carolina try to prove Donald Trump wasn't a racist by bringing out a black prop. Press play. Uh, do you know Lynn Patton? I'm, I'm right here. Oh, yes, sir. Do you know Lynn Patton? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I asked Lynn to come today in her personal capacity uh, to actually shed some light. H how long have you known Ms. Patton? I'm responsible for Lynn Patton joining the Trump Organization and the job that she currently holds. Well, uh, that's, I'm glad you acknowledge that because you made some very um, demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for, a, for a, an individual who was racist. How do you reconcile the two of those, Mr. As neither should I, as the son of a Holocaust survivor. But, Mr. Cohen, I guess what I'm saying is, is I've talked to, to the president over 300 times. I've not heard one time a racist comment out of out of his mouth in private so how do you reconcile it do you have proof of those conversations I would ask you to do you ask have tape recordings of those conversations no sir well you've taped everybody else that's, why wouldn't you that's have a also tape not true sir that's not true you haven't taped anybody I, I have taped individuals. how many times have you taped individuals maybe a hundred times over ten years is that a low estimate because I've, I've heard it's over 200 times no I don't think I think it's approximately about a hundred from what I recall but I would ask so you, why would, you ask me a question, you, sir. Do you have so proof? Here's, do will, you have proof, I yes do, or no? I do. Oh, where's the proof? Ask Ms. Patton how many people who are black are executives at the Mr. Trump Organization. Mr. And the answer Cohen, is Mr. zero. Mr. Cohen, we can go through this. Here's, I, would ask you ask you, me, I would ask unanimous consent that her entire statement be put in the record. Well, Congresswoman Britta Lawrence of Michigan, she was like, that's some bullshit. Um, I just want to put on the record as being a black American and having endured the public comments of racism from the sitting president as being a black person, I can only imagine what's being said in private. And to prop up one member of our entire race of black people and say that that nullifies that is totally insulting and in, in, in this environment of expecting a president to be inclusive and to look at his administration speaks volume. Now, Delegate Stacey Plaskett of the U.S. Virgin, Virgin Islands, let's just say she had no issues letting Republicans know black folks not trying to hear this. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a lot to do as well. Um, I've got houses and schools to help rebuild in the Virgin Islands, expansion of voting rights, educational opportunities, criminal justice reform. Thank God the Democratic majority can walk and chew gum at the same time. So we're here with you right now. Um, Mr. Cohen, you learned well in the 10 years that you worked with Donald Trump. What was your position with the GOP in the up to eight months ago? I was vice chair of the RNC Finance Committee. You were vice chair of the finance of the Republican National Committee, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I do want to say I was a Democrat until Steve Wynn found out I was a Democrat and made me switch parties. That would be said a smart thing right to do. it wasn't right for a Democrat to be the vice chair. Good. Let's get to it. I, I only, only have a little bit of time. On behalf of the many members uh, here who have expressed 
to your family, uh, our apologies to your family. But I want to apologize for the inappropriate comments and tweets that have been made by other members of this uh, body. Um, and as a former prosecutor and as former counsel on House ethics, I think that at the very least there should be a referral to the Ethics Committee of witness intimidation or tampering under USC 1512 of my uh, colleague Matt Gates, and it may be possibly him being referred for a criminal prosecution. So I want to put that on. <laughs> Matt, your ass in trouble. The Florida Bar is also investigating Matt Gates. He could have his law license in trouble. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, she jammed him up, and he said, uh, that's not really what I was trying to do, but I apologize. I deleted my tweet. Little late, player. Little late. Uh, now, uh, a new member of Congress, Ayanna Presley, Massachusetts, uh, she also had a couple things to ask. Roll it. Would you agree that uh, someone could deny... Uh, rental units to African Americans, uh, lead the birther movement, refer to the diaspora as shithole countries, and refer to white supremacists as fine people, have a black friend and still be racist? Yes. I agree. All my colleagues are trying to discredit your testimony by some of your own unlawful acts and lies, that they are disconnected with the fact that you were the personal lawyer for this president of the United States, that this president chose you as his legal counsel. My stance has always been the same, Mr. Chairman, based on the facts, not on future reports that we're all waiting on. My residents back home don't need a collusion cause with a foreign government to know this president, individual one, has disregarded the law of the land, the United States Constitution. Okay, I need y'all to get ready, because you're about to see a crying white man. Press play. Mist used his pardon powers. Do you think the President of the United States is making decisions in the best interest of the American people? No, I don't. Especially those you said that he used horrible words about, like African Americans, Muslim Americans, and immigrants? Yes. Just to make a note, Mr. Chairman, just because someone has a person of color, a black person working for them, does not mean they aren't racist. And it is insensitive that some would even say it's the fact that someone would actually use a prop, a black woman, in this chamber, in this committee, is alone racist in itself. Donald Trump is setting Mr. President, Chairman, I ask that her words Donald be Trump taken down. Donald Trump is setting a precedent. I reclaim my time. Mr. Donald Chairman. Trump is setting a precedent. Mr. Chairman. Oh, my God. Let it roll. Can be a Mr. Game Chairman, game the rules are activity. clear. Cover up and hold on to business assets to break campaign finance laws and constitutional clauses. What we have here, Mr. Chairman, is criminal conduct in the pursuit of the highest public office by Mr. Cohen and Individual One. I hope that the gravity of this situation hits everyone in this body and in Congress and across this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the rest of my time. It's Mr. Chairman, I ask that her words, when she's referring to an individual member of this body, be taken down and stricken from the record. I'm sure she didn't intend to do this, but if anyone knows my record as it relates, it should be you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I, I, I would like to... Hold. You, my black friend. <laughs> Press play. Go on. I want the words read no, no, back. No, 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 no. We want to know exactly no, what she said me. about a colleague. Excuse me. Would you like to rephrase that statement, Ms. Talib? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can actually read it from here. Just to make a note, Mr. Chairman, that just because someone has a person of color, a black person working for them, does not mean they are racist. And it is insensitive that someone would even say racist, say, say it is racist in itself, and to use a black woman as a prop to, move, to prove it otherwise. And I can submit this for the record. If a colleague is thinking that that's what I'm saying, I'm just saying that's what I believe to have happened. And if as a person of color in this committee, that's how I felt at that moment, and I wanted to express that. But... I am not calling the gentleman, um, Mr. Meadows, a racist for doing so. I'm saying that in its... It's, but I think his ass racist. <laughs> I think he like racist, racist. Press play. 
itself, it is a racist act. Well, I hope not, Mr. Chairman, because I need to be clear on this well, particular. Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Meadows, wait a minute. I, I've defended you uh, at, no, uh, no, about, Mr. Meadows, uh, with false accusations. Mr. Meadows. I'm the chair. I'm the HNIC. Back. Where you are. Thank you. Right. I will clear this up. Now, Ms. Salib, is it, I want to make sure I understand. You did not, you were not intending to call Mr. Meadows a racist, is that right? No, Mr. Chairman, I do not call Mr. Meadows a racist. No, I am trying, minute, as a person of color, Mr. Chairman, just to express myself and how I felt at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so, just for the record, that's what was my intention. All right. All right. Mr. Meadows. Mr. Meadows. Mr. Chairman. There's nothing more personal to me than my relationship. My nieces and nephews are people of color. Not many people know that. You know that, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And to indicate that I asked someone who is a personal friend of the, the Trump family, who has worked for him, who knows this particular individual, that she's coming in to be a prop, it's racist to suggest that I ask her to come in here for that reason. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, the president's own person, she's a family member, she, she loves the, this family, she came in because she felt like the president of the United States was getting falsely accused. And, and Mr. Chairman, you are, you and I have a personal relationship that's not based on color. And <laughs> Y'all press play. And to even go down this direction is, is wrong, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank the gentleman for what you have stated. Um, if there's anyone who is sensitive with regard to race, it's me. Son of former sharecroppers that were basically slaves. So I, I get it. Um, I listened very carefully to Ms. Tully. And I think, and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to put words in her mouth, but I think she said that she was not calling you a racist. And I thought that we could clarify that. Because you, Ms. Mr. Meadows, you know, uh, and of all the people on this committee, uh, I've said it and got in trouble for it, that you're one of my best friends. I know that shocks a lot of people. Now what's this, the green book? This, this the green book now? This, this driving Mr. Meadows? Let's go to my pound. Deshondra Jefferson, principal, the Raven Group, Joe Madison, whole <laughs> serious XM Radio, Tiffany Lofton, civil and labor union organizer. I am the national director of the Youth College Mission. Damn it, I'm not done. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just check it. You uh, calm your ass down? Uh, how you want me to calm down? Why don't you go ahead and say, since you already just gave your damn title. Camera number one. Like, I couldn't give it. Camera go ahead. One. Hi, I'm Tiffany Dina Lofton. I'm the national director for the Youth and College Division and longtime friend of Mr. Roland Martin, who's one of my mentors. Camera. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I was talking to you, Joe. I, oh, my God. I, I, I really get a kick out of offending white people. <laughs> I need a tissue. Especially when they got nieces and nephews who are people of color. <laughs> you know, Malcolm X. <laughs> One said. Is that what you're going to start? Yeah, so, yeah that's where I'm going to start. It. Let, let me start now. I, I love you know, it. Okay, Malcolm I love X. It. And because folks need to understand history. They do. You know, first of all, Malcolm X once said whenever a white person hears something that they don't want or don't like, first thing they do is go out and find some Negro to come in and counter mm -hmm. what is, has been said. Got a cosign. Yeah, right. and so, so that's exactly what he he did. I really felt sorry for the young lady who allowed herself to be used. You mean Lynn Patton? Lynn Patton as a prop, and you kind of look at her, and it was like she did kind of talk over to somebody, like, "How do I get out of here?" Right. But, like, can I sit down? <laughs> well, am I done? Can I sit I, down? Can I sit down? Can I sit down now? It. it, it well, first it, of all, Joe, I've never seen that. I have never oh, seen, no ever seen a that. member of Congress bring a, bring somebody a prop. on the rostrum. A human prop. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen them going the out in the audience, yes. but I've never seen that, Deshaun. I've never seen no, that. No, no. Yeah, let's just let's just call. The, I mean, first of all, let's just understand what this this was. He he. It, it's it's the, it's the same as saying I have black friends. 
It's, it, you know, bl black folk have worked for white folk who they've known are, have, have races and are, have attitudes. Look, black folks work for slave owners. I mean, this is not new. I mean, we've always had jobs where we've been treated Raise in, their the worst, in the worst way. That absolutely right. This was pitiful. I mean, quite honestly, and I know you're getting there, and I'll, and I'll just close out. All this was was an attempt to kill the messenger. They didn't address any issue that dealt with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a pattern of racism that goes back to putting C's mm -hmm. on uh, apartment applications. The Chandra, and, and, you know, he just has a long record. Here's what stood out to me: the they're trying to take out a dude by saying you a liar, but he was the one defending a liar. Exactly. Mm. And not one time could they sit there and actually defend Donald Trump because they know they can't defend not one the liar. Not well, one no, they, they, they can defend him, and that was the entire point of his line of questioning, is to deflect from himself and to deflect from the liar president that we have up there. And honestly, I was offended. All of us were offended mm -hmm. by Lynn Patton being trotted up, you know, like held up as a prop. But the thing is, I, honestly, Roland, I don't think she was offended or Oh, she's not. she's not. Oh, no, no, no. Lynn Patton is cool with it. She's, I mean, she's been, that's her thing as, hey, uh, look, remember, Lynn Patton was a party planner. Yes who all of a sudden now is a high-ranking executive in HUD. And then it was a trip. So she's supposedly she's moved into New York public housing yep. for like a week to highlight the inequities in the public housing. But then she sent notice that, well, I got to leave because I got official business in D.C. That was it? That was it? Yeah, no. That was your official business? To come there and look like a lawn jockey? Stay next to Mark Meadows? Tiffany, that was a joke. I, I, that was a joke. Let me say two things as a precursor. One, I will forever watch hearing meetings from now on with you. <laughs> That's one. The, the one. Two, I think that it is a, a shameful day in American politics and history and in democracy, really, when we have to sit here and watch white people and black people in Congress debate whether or not one of them is racist and then point the finger at Cohen and say that he's a racist and then point the finger at Donald Trump and say he's a racist. I heard the a lot of the testimony today during a meeting in a meeting I was in. They called Donald Trump a racist, a bigot, a con man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But to my community and my people, we already knew this. Hashtag we tried to tell you. We tried you. to tell you before the campaign trail, during the campaign trail, and then after he was elected. So this was a, a mockery of an attempt to talk about the, the, the moral values and positions of Donald Trump, y'all's president, mm -hmm. and instead of us getting to the root of the cause, which was focusing on Donald Trump paid this man $35,000 in a check as hush money. He talked crap about paid his Paid it while he was, was in the Oval yeah. Office. While he was president. He committed, a, he committed a crime. While he was president, he committed a crime. He also told Cohen, listen, send a threat to everybody. I don't want my grades from school being yeah. released. I don't want my SAT scores being released. I don't want nobody to know that. But I'm he called for Obama's records. I'm just saying. And birth certificate, and the list goes That's on. That's what bullies do. That's what bullies do. That's, That's what also what do. bigots do. That's also what con men do. That's also what racist people do. But, 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 the, thing, so but the thing here is, the thing here is, and this is what, what was truly laughable to me, uh, and, and when, when, when Representative Plaskett said, yeah, we, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. That was funny. That was hilarious. And the fact that they refuse to deal with the reality that you have an undeniable liar who is in the Oval Office. Who has committed crimes. Who said, mm -hmm. oh, no, I turned over my business to my sons. Mm -hmm. But here you got the man's lawyer saying, no, he's still writing mm -hmm. Trump Organization checks in the White House. Mm -hmm. He laid out a series of things by saying, I can't get into that because it's actually under investigation. And the Republicans know they cannot defend it. And so we do know Michael Cohen lied, but he also, I thought, was hilarious. I've covered trials. I've watched trials. How many times have y'all seen seven, I mean, a, a, a mobster testify against another mobster? And you can say, you're a killer. Yes, I am. <laughs> but he told me to kill. Yeah. And that's yeah. what it sounded. This, this, <laughs> this reminded me literally of the testimony, Joe, uh, in, the 50, in, the, in, in the 60s of mobsters who, with Cosa Nostra, was called out and they were all called through. That's what it sounded like. I, I totally agree with you. And keep in mind, he's not on trial. 
He's not. He's already. I'm talking about Cohen. Yeah. And that's how the Republicans approach this. That as if he's on trial. He is not on trial. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little subdued because I had to take a nap. I just got tired of, and, and maybe as I'm showing my age, I just got tired of hearing the same thing from every Republican. And, and, and we can say what we want to, but the, I'll give them credit. Boy, they can stick to a script. Like a like a Broadway Talk play, away. especially the You ain't got you, nothing else. Uh, you got a book deal. You gonna do a book deal? I, I love this one. Will you say under oath that you will not sign a book deal? And he's like, he said no. Yeah. I just told y'all yesterday I lost my law license. Hell no, I ain't gonna tell you. I ain't right. gonna sign a book. I mean, it was like they were stuck on a book deal. Yes, they were. They right. were stuck. stuck on a television show. They're stuck on stupid. Yeah, they're, they're stuck on stupid. That's stuck on stupid. Stuck on. <laughs> No, they, they, have to keep, they have to keep distracting from the real issues because they have nothing else. Nothing I mean, else. I will give Cohen credit when they ask him, well, what does that make you? And he said, a fool. I mean, he knows. Mm -hmm. Listen. He, we all know he's a liar. We all know he's a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar. But, you but, you know, I, I, but I did, I, and I'm going to do this tomorrow morning on my show, and I know you got Derek on from NXT. And he's up next. Well, Derek, you ought to give Cohen an award. <laughs> the NAACP mm. ought we to ain't give... We ain't gonna do that. <laughs> no, no, listen. Understand my sarcasm. Go ahead. They ought to give him an award because what Cohen did was what a lot of us, a lot of people don't obviously see. He brought us inside... That's right. Yeah. ...the operation. He brought us inside those private conversations... That's right. ...that you don't have, that you don't have a tape. Mm -hmm. Why would I? Why? Why would he have? Why would Cohen have a tape when he's probably used the N word a hundred times yeah. himself yeah. and wouldn't have a problem admitting? That's what I mean sarcastically. That no, he okay. he brought all of us inside these conversations that take place in back rooms, take place at poker tables, take place in bars, yeah. and 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 he has exposed. Uh, um, uh, the uh, Trump for what he is, but, but the reality be, is, Trump has exposed we, we, we know uh, what he was from the. Well, get I was gonna say no, no, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Trump has exposed himself when he came out and announced his his run, you know, for the presidency. The you know, yeah. be, before that was the birther thing, but when he's calling, you know, Mexican immigrants, right. you know, criminals, racists, drug dealers, you know, we've seen this language from him, and I'm tired mm -hmm. of people pretending right. like none of this existed. Remember the judge in Indiana. Uh, I want to be very, I want to be very, very clear that this is super important because this man, Donald Trump, plans on running for re-election, and if we're going to talk about not just his his personality, which we all know is out of this world and effed up, but his actual crimes that he has committed while he is president mm -hmm. that we need to take seriously, which my auntie Ax Ma Maxine Waters has been saying he needs to be impeached for a very long time, that, that the way this testimony plays out and what we don't hear, because yesterday there was a private testimony that we didn't get a chance to see, and tomorrow we're not going to see the testimony that Michael Cohen's going to do again, that, that all of this is, even though it's not a trial, should be taken seriously in consideration not only with trying the president for the crimes that he's done, but re-electing somebody, not re-electing somebody who does not deserve to be in office in the first place. Uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings, he closed the hearing out uh, with a powerful speech. Uh, I, w I want to go ahead and play some of that before we go to our next story. Uh, so folks, let me know when y'all got that queued up. And so th this was the end of the hearing. It took place all day, of course. They had a couple of breaks. Uh, one members of Congress had to go vote. Uh, and so this was Congressman Elijah Cummings um, closing the hearing down. We are better than this. We are so much, we really are. As a country, we are so much better than this. And, you know, I told you, I, I, and, 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 and for some reason, Mr. Cohen, I've, I've, I tell my, 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 my children, I say when bad things happen to you, do not ask the question, why did it happen to me? Ask the question, why did it happen for me? I don't know why this is happening for you. But it is my hope that a small part of it is for our country to be better. If I hear you correctly, it sounds like <clears throat> you're crying out for a new normal, for us getting back to normal. It sounds to me like you want to make sure 
that our democracy stays intact. When I, the one meeting I had with President Trump, I said to him, the greatest gift that you and I, Mr. President, can give to our children is making sure that we give them a democracy that is intact. A not democracy better than the one that we came upon. And I'm hoping that the things you said today will help us begin to get back there. You know, I mean, come on now. I mean, when you got, according to the Washington Post, our president has made at least 8,718 8, false and mis or misleading statements. That's stunning. That's not what we teach our children. I don't teach mine that. And for whatever reason, you sound like you got caught up in it. You got caught up in it. You got caught up in it. And some kind of way, I hope that you will, I, I know that it's painful going to prison. I know, I know it's got to be painful being called a rat. And let me, let me explain. A lot of people don't know the significance of that, but I live in the inner city of Baltimore. All right? And when you call somebody a rat, that's one of the worst things you can call them because when they go to prison, that means a snitch. I'm just saying. And so the president called you a rat. We're better than that. We really are. And I'm hoping that all of us can get back to this democracy that we want and that we should be passing on our, to our children so that they can do better than what we did. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, in 2019, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? Did we stand on the sidelines and say nothing? Go ahead and preach, preach your comments. All right, y'all, uh, we're going to move on to our next story. Uh, yesterday, NAACP President Derek Johnson rang the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange uh, to highlight the NAACP's Minority Empowerment ETF. An ETF is like a mutual fund that will invest in companies that invest in our community and support the goals of the NAACP. This is a way to support social justice and maybe make some money at the same time. It's the first time in the 110 year history that the NAACP has participated in the opening or closing of the New York Stock Exchange. Joining us right now is Derek Johnson to we'll talk about this ETF. Derek, glad to have you. Where did this originate from uh, to create this ETF, and how long have y'all been working on this? Uh, uh, Roller, first of all, thank you for having me on the show with one of my idols, Joe Madison, uh, who for many years served on the board and on staff. And then uh, the person, my new boss, Tiffany Lofton, who tried to tell me what to do, even though I think she is the youth director. She uh, tell that all so of us ETF. what to do. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the, 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 the concept of an electronic trading fund is born out of the legacy of the NAACP. There was a time where we had a fair share agreement program. And then we started doing industry reports. We've had other iterations of how to hold corporations accountable uh, as it relates to our value system and diversity. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, thought, so I heard somebody talking. And so uh, ETFs are, have been a, a growing part of investment strategies, particularly for pension funds that are adopting socially responsible lending. For the NAACP, we've already had an industry report, and we've seen this instrument as, as an opportunity for us to uh, create a market-driven uh, imperative for companies to have diversity. This is getting pension funds who have adopted uh, uh, social responsible investment principles, uh, uh, providing them with the index. And the ETF is an index on diversity. Do you have uh, African Americans on your board? Do you have African Americans in C-suite? Gotcha. What is your procurement chain? And all of those things come together. And our partner, uh, Morningstar, through an analytic firm called Synalytics, they measure companies' performance based on the companies filing their SEC forms. Uh, it is a strategy 
to 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 hold corporations accountable for diversity, knowing that corporations have one responsibility legally, and that's to maximize profit for shareholders. And until we deal with uh, impacting the profits, then we will always be in this perpetual treadmill of companies do bad, we we jump in, they do good for a while until they go back and do bad again. So how? Now so what is so what is so what is ETF, Derek? How can a person watching, how can someone on the panel, uh, how can, what, is, is it something they can invest in? So h how, how does that work for the consumer? It's, it's a mutual fund for the most part. Got it. Uh, it's, it's a mutual fund where people can invest in. It, it drives a conversation around corporate diversity. Uh, the NAACP, we, we are given the value proposition of what the criteria should be in terms of diversity and then uh, uh our partner morningstar and impact strategies they manage and then they rate the funds and what the investment that come in there in wsp generate revenue uh, as we hold companies accountable okay so we're not beholden to the companies we are beholden to a value system of, of diversity all right then well uh we certainly appreciate it where can folks go learn more about this NAACP etf uh, you you can uh, uh, look up online impact impact strategies uh, impact shares I'm sorry impact shares NACP ETF and information come up there you can uh, look them up on New York Stock Exchange where uh, the, the fund is publicly traded on the stock exchange uh, we were pleased that we had uh, the first individual uh, to put the uh, billion dollars into the fund and we're going to grow it over time all right Derek Johnson of CEO NACP we certainly appreciate it thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, let's talk about history being made in Chicago. Uh, on April 2nd, when the runoff is held uh, for mayor of Chicago, a black woman will be elected mayor of that city. It will be the second time in history an African-American is elected mayor. In 1983, Congressman Harold Washington was elected mayor. He was reelected in 1987, but just a few couple of weeks after that reelection, he died of a heart attack uh, while at his desk in a meeting. Eugene Sawyer was chosen uh, to fill out the remainder of his term. But yesterday's runoff, where uh, no candidate got uh, 50 plus 1 percent of the vote, uh, it will come down to these two black women. Uh, and first off, you have Lori Lightfoot, of course, a uh, longtime federal prosecutor. She got 17.5 percent of the vote. And Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, uh, she got 16 percent of the vote. Here's how the Chicago Tribune described the two. The results set up a showdown between two self-styled progressives. Preckwinkle, chair of the Cook County Democratic Party and a former longtime alderman who rose from Hyde Park's bastion of liberal politics versus Lightfoot, a first-time candidate who has railed against Chicago's history of machine politics and vowed to usher in a new era of reform at City Hall. Now, Bill Daly, the son of one Chicago mayor and the brother of another, he finished in third place. Folks, uh, there were some 14 candidates who ran uh, for mayor. Willie Wilson, African-American businessman, got 10.5 percent. Amara Inia, an activist and community organizer who was supported by the likes of Chance the Rapper and Kanye West, she got 8 percent. LaShawn Ford, a former state legislator and current real estate investor, he got 1 percent. Neil Sales Griffin, an educator, got 0.2 three uh, percent of the vote uh, in that particular race uh, now in the case of Lightfoot she calls herself a triple threat tre triple threat that she is a black woman that she, well, first of all she's a woman that she's black and she's a lesbian uh, she has been nasty a nasty race between her and Preck. we're going to go to our panel here uh, these two do not like each other uh, at one point some said that Preckwinkle tried to offer Lightfoot a high-ranking job in the county to get her to drop out Lightfoot blasted that. Uh, this is going to be uh, a lot of heat over the next 30 plus days in Chicago uh, because, uh, again, this is for the control of the city and the people who don't understand Chicago. Strong. The ma strong mayor. mayor. Yep. The mayor of Chicago controls the city budget, yep. the housing budget, controls the schools, controls the transportation budget. That's a whole lot of power invested in one person. The airport. <laughs> Same thing, all of that. All I mean, governor of a state. Yeah. And that's why it's hard to run against an incumbent because if you got a contract with the city of Chicago, yeah, it's not you can't support yeah. somebody running against the mayor because you will get cut off. Well, right. this, I think this also speaks to the fact that I do hope 
this doesn't get down to a campaign of personalities, of insulting one another, because what you just described is everything that is at stake. And that's what I'm really afraid of, and, and, and the media may drive that. Uh, but the last thing you need are two black women uh, that are on each other's case over personal <clears throat> issues when you know we have we all have serious issues in, in Chicago. It's got to be based on issues. The other issue that you have here is that Chicago is, is such a unique city mm -hmm. in that it still is one of the most racist cities in America in terms of how voting takes place. Yeah. Uh, African Americans uh, uh, have six of the top ten voting wards. Uh, and the fact that you have two black candidates who are in mm -hmm. the top two positions is shocking. The reason you need 50 plus 1 percent yeah. is because of Harold Washington. Yeah. When he ran in 83, he ran against incumbent Jane Byrne yeah. and then Cook County State's Attorney uh, Richard Daley. Well, because he, got, he, he won the most votes in the primary, he went on to the general election. Now, Chicago is a Democratic city. Mm -hmm. White folks were so angry with a black mayor right. that he barely beat Bernard Upton. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, Upton was running ads basically saying, vote for me before it's too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and they blocked, and so what they did, they changed the rules. And then if you run, that you ran, you had to get 50 plus one in the primary because they said we will never have another Harold Washington. Uh, and so this is gonna be interesting to Joe's point, how this thing breaks down with issues and what voter turnout was gonna be like. Well, first of all, this is Chicago politics we're talking about. It's not going to be just on policy. It's going to be on personality. As Roland mentioned, it's already kind of gotten ugly when, you know, one candidate's offering another one a high-ranking job. Now, Tony Preckwinkle, first of all, I um, grew up outside of Chicago. And I remember when uh, Mayor Washington died. I remember little white kids coming up to me and making racist comments about, oh, well, we finally got rid of him. Like, excuse me? But that legacy is still there in Chicago, even though it is, has such a high concentration of people of color, people that look like us. But this race is going to be ugly. I'm sorry. It's going to be like knockdown drag out because so much is at stake. And you have someone who came up through the party system, someone who is the quote unquote establishment candidate versus that insurgent outsider. This is going to be interesting, the race to watch, but it ain't going to be about policy. It's going to be about personality. Well, Tiffany, with also, I think, for black folks to understand, this boils down to power. Um, Harold Washington. <clears throat> brought in a number of black folks yeah. into city government um, that, had, that had been locked out. Um, general counsel, legal counsel, so many other positions. Uh, and the white folks in Chicago, uh, the aldermen, they did everything to block him. Ed Burke, who also was, in, who, was indicted, mm -hmm. who won yesterday, uh, he was one of those leaders. And when I say they tried, I mean, many people in Chicago still believe that the, the pressure that Harold Washington was under for four years caused his death because of how white folks on that alderman, how they treated him. And so for African Americans, now you're talking about um, not being in the position. Because, look, I spent six years there, and all black folks would say is when Harold was mayor, when Harold was mayor, and I kept saying, damn it, y'all, he dead. Right. And how do you have that many black people who are, who are in the city and they're not voting? So now I have an opportunity for an African American to be back as the mayor of Chicago is a huge deal. It could be a power thing, too. Yeah, it's a, it's a power thing, it's an access thing, but what you said, Roland, was key. We have to, when this runoff happens in April, the folks in Chicago are determining their future. They are going to be going to the polls to determine which direction do we want our schools to go in, what direction do we want our communities to go in, what direction do we want our infrastructure to go in. And in a, and in a race like this for mayor, and you have all the other races that are happening across the country, it's going to be really important to determine where the power lies, who's going to be in charge, and who's setting the agenda and priorities for that community. They must take it seriously. I, I, I'm not from Chicago. I'm from L.A. But I think it's really important that, the, that the, the constituencies, the members, the city, and the community of Chicago actually do take in priority what the issues are going to be, what the policies are going to be, and what the track record has been, and, and not Joe personality. Joe Preckwinkle raised $4 million, uh, Lightfoot raised a little over 700000 yeah. but she mm. ran an insurgent campaign as a federal prosecutor and a crusader. Do you believe that with Lightfoot saying, I'm an outsider, mm. and I'm running against the ultimate insider? I don't think it's going to work in Chicago. 
Um, I go back to, I, I was living in Detroit at the time. Cohen Young had the same issue. I lived right. in Detroit mm -hmm. when Cohen Young was, was, was mayor. Same issue, and you're absolutely right. When these African-American mayors came into power, the one thing they did was to, and I always use this word, integrate. And integration is not the mixing of colors. Mm. It's the sharing of power, resources, and responsibility, because what is like segregated that. is power. Right. And what the mayor, like what what Mayor Harold Washington did was he he integrated, as you know, Roland and others that lived there. He integrated the power. You've got black folk right now who owe Harold Washington yeah. the fact that they are <laughs> living pretty good. Same thing happened in Detroit. Same thing happened here with Marion Barry yep. in Washington D.C. Um, I remember almost losing my first job. As, uh, as the political director of SEIU because I went on weekends and worked for Harold Washington. Folk around the country came in and, would, and doing nothing but passing out. And I had a president of SEIU who told me that I could not go on weekends and work for Harold Washington because the unions, the unions were backing his opponent. These were Europeans, second, third generation Europeans, and they were not going to wow. turn the power over yeah. to an African American. And, the, and, and I told him, well, look, I, I'm a black man. I said, well, no, you're labor. I said, excuse me, on my bet birth certificate, it does not say labor. <laughs> it says black man. And I and, and almost lost my job well, I'll tell as you the political director. So here's what I'm ending with. It, it, it has to be about policy, it and, it, and I'm going to tell you, watch the labor unions. Oh, here's the deal. Uh, watch the it, labor SCIU, unions. SEIU, Chicago Teachers Thank Union, Chicago they back yep. Preckwinkle yep. in, uh, in the general, excuse me, in the, in the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue is Lightfoot did not raise a lot of money. She's going to have to raise money real quickly. Uh, and so you'll see who's going to be endorsing, That's whether right. she can raise the money. But I still say, as somebody who is running as a crusader, Mm -hmm. You've dealt with Rahm Emanuel and Daly. You dealt with with Laquan McDonald Tate. Yeah. You dealt with police uh, abuse as well. This is where being an outsider works, and being the fact that she's a, full, a federal prosecutor. But everybody out there, do not underestimate the Chicago machine. That's right. Even when it comes, if a black person is leading it, because they're the ones who That's they right. under the Chicago machine, the the Cook County Democratic Party. The last thing they want is a reformer as the mayor of the city because that messes with this. So we'll be paying attention. The runoff is going to be April 2nd, and we're going to be trying to get both of them on Roland Martin Unfiltered to answer a few questions. Folks, let's now go to Columbus, Ohio, where community organizer Amber Evans has been missing nearly for nearly a month. Her car was found, but very few details have emerged since then. Evan was an, Evans was an outspoken critic of the Columbus Police Department, and many believe that they're just not trying hard enough to find her. A couple of days ago, I got an email uh, from Amber's mother, uh, Tanya Fisher. Uh, we, of course, have been covering this case. I've had numerous people asking me uh, to, to cover this case. I sent text messages to members of Congress as well, asking them to pay attention about this case as well. Uh, and so I'm glad that uh, Tanya sent me that email. Tanya, welcome to Roller Martin Unfiltered. Hey, good morning. So, so first, the last time you talked to and saw your daughter. The last time I had um, spoke to my daughter was the Saturday before um, that uh, Monday. And um, she had spent time that Friday with her siblings at my mother's home. Um, and they had all got together. They had a great um, time, from what I understand. I was in Cleveland for a little bit that evening on Friday. So then Saturday, I didn't talk to her Friday night, but then Saturday I talked to her in the mid-afternoon. And uh, we had a real good conversation. Um, she seemed to be really good in spirits. I was asking her how the new job was going and everything. She was like, it's just, it's work. And then I was like, well... I understand. I said, um, so what's going on with it? And she was just like, it's just trying to pull things together, you know, because it's a new position. I said, yeah. And then I said, well, you're going to turn, you know, 29 coming up. And I said, so 
you know, I always have this running joke with my other kids and with all the kids really that, um, you know, I have six kids, so I'm going to graduate six times. I'm going to go to college six times, all those things. So I said, um, Amber, I said, what are we going to do in our 30, 40 life, you know? And I said, what would you want to do that would make you really happy? And um, if you didn't have to think about anything else, what would you do that you could just let go of and just be happy? And she said she would want to go back to Paris, where she spent some time. I think it was like seven and a half months there, um, altogether 14 months um, in Paris teaching English to... um, the kids over there. So what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand, I've been reading these stories. So she drives her car to a particular area that she liked to often go to. And is it this Skioto River? Um, and um, what, what, did they, what, what did, did they discover her car door open or did they discover what was her purse there? Was her belongings there? Uh, and for, for police, they just say she's just gone. Yeah. So, I was the one that discovered her car based off of what her boyfriend Mark told me, and um, just shocked. So her and her bo- so I understand her and her boyfriend had an argument. Well, I don't think it was quite an argument. I just think at, at this uh, point in time, I think Amber was just kind of tired of, you know, being in this relationship and um, was trying to look for a future life. You know, like what it means to be an executive director of a um, organization that deals mainly with the black community. And um, Amber was kind of like the modern day Angel Davis. She had right. like the trips and things, you know, around to North Carolina, to the plantations, to the, you know, cotton fields and things. And so she was just getting more and more in tune with her African-American side. So the, so correct me, so, so did the boyfriend call you and then did you then say, let me try to uh, go out and find her? And then that's why you discovered the car? Well, I had received a text. All of us had received a text. Just a two word, which is kind of strange because Amber is a writer. So, you know, usually if she's going to write you something, it's going to be a long paragraph, a long page or a book um, just to say whatever she was feeling. So that kind of caught me off guard. And then when I got the text, I just kind of, uh, responded back to her like what are you talking like you know what do you mean um and so then at the same time my phone rings and it happened to be mark and he was crying and upset and i got kind of alerted because i had just walked in the door with my other daughter and we prepared her for college and it just caught me off guard to hear him crying and to receive that text from amber so i just kind of got my stuff back when I was running back to the car. And um, so at this point, he told me where she was. And so that- And, 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 and according to the story, she sent a text that said, I love you and I'm sorry. Right, exactly. So that was and on, so, that was on, um, again, that was, uh, that, that text on came- Monday night. It came in at 8.07 PM. Yeah. And um, do you believe that the Columbus Police Department is doing all they can. I'm reading one story. They're saying that the conditions of the Skeeto River had been too difficult for them to actually search for her body. Uh, just... Well, we had ordered we had ordered for a meeting with them because after you know almost going into three weeks of just total nightmare, just worry, just crying, just not knowing anything, not hearing anything. I had never talked to the lead detective before and he didn't interview me or anything. And so at that point I was just a little bit furious and frustrated. Mm -hmm. So I had, um, that's when I guess everybody had reached out on, um, the behalf of me, you know, hearing my stories, hearing my frustration. And I guess that's when Congress, um, woman Betty got involved. And, um, at that point, they um, allowed us to have a meeting with them. And so in this meeting, I brought seven of my top um, family, you know, members and friends. And um, we began to question them pretty heavily about things. And it still wasn't making a lot of sense because we've seen numerous times on 
television on the right. news at 11 o'clock, you know, Fox News at 10 o'clock, all these different genres, MSB, MSNC, I'm sorry, MSNBC, I'm sorry, um, news channels that, you know, when people are missing of the opposite race, they run in, they're diving in. Yeah, they're well. There. Well, and look, we, we've covered we've covered those. Uh, and look, that's the reality is that uh, when it's white, they're right, and they cover those stories. That was one of the reasons why we wanted to keep this focus as well. You're a former mental health worker, uh, and this is yes. the last question for you. You're adamant that your daughter did not commit suicide. I'm very adamant at that because it just is not adding up. And for everybody to just well, not just everybody, but the boyfriend to be so final. And then for him to be executing things with even her landlord, like he, for him to bail out of the apartment that they're staying in, to run home to his parents, to the things that are set up the way that they are, things just don't make sense. And it's just the truth. It just doesn't add up and make sense. We need some answers to a timeline. And we need those answers now. And I'm giving, I'm the one that's giving the police the avenues of what they need to know as far as, you know, things that I'm finding and discovering, I'm passing that on. Gotcha. And now, and now I'm the one that's talking directly to the sergeant um, of the Columbus Police Department. I'm no longer dealing with the lead detective. Um, so at this point, we just need answers and they're promising, you know, now we're just now lighting the fire. Right. You know, which is sad because it's, five weeks and we've lost so much ground. So it just seems like we're just now lighting the fire. But to let them know and for the world to know that we are not going to stop. This is my job now. Right. And I'm not going to stop as a mother. I mean, if you know anything about, you know, the cord that ties a mother to their child, I'm that mother. I don't stop. I won't, you know, quit. It won't. There's nothing that was is going to make this any different so they better get ready because it isn't going to end well tanya so gonna... um we certainly appreciate uh you reaching out to uh me sending me that email well, that's why we wanted to have you on folks if you have any information regarding amber evans uh the columbus police department's missing persons unit is 614-645-4280 614-645-4280. Uh, Tanya, we're going to be uh, hoping for the best, uh, and uh, we're going to keep uh, the attention on this story as well because one of the reasons we created this show is because we understand the mainstream media doesn't cover our stories. Uh, and so hopefully somebody who's watching this right now on YouTube or Facebook or Periscope got any information, hopefully uh, we can have some good news about the whereabouts of your daughter, Amber Evans. We appreciate you joining us. Yes, thank you, Roland. Thank you, Jackie. All right. Uh, Tanya Fisher, thanks a bunch. The mother of Amber Evans. Folks, we're going to go to a break. We'll be back on Roller Martin Unfiltered in just a moment. If they take my life, it won't stop the revolution. Poet Nika Giovanni. All right, folks, HBCU Giving Day. Our university is Lane College, associated with the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, located in Jackson, Tennessee, founded in 1882. Notable graduates include Donald L. Hollowell, Dave Clark, and Jacoby Jones, and also I did their commencement there, so I appreciate uh, getting an uh, honorary degree from Lane College. If you want to support them, go to lanecollege.edu, lanecollege.edu. All right, folks, calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders. Enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will receive a grant of twenty-five up to $25,000 to implement their proposal. The deadline to apply is March 31st, 2019. Go to fgb.life for more information and to apply. Remember, Ford goes further in our communities. All right, folks, Republicans love talking about voter fraud, but why are they so quiet about 
what they did in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District. Well, check this out. McCray Dallas, the man accused of running an absentee ballot scheme on behalf of the Republican candidate Mark Harris, has been arrested and charged with a series of felonies primarily related to his handling of absentee ballots in the 2016 general election and 2018 primary. The charges were brought by Wake County District Attorney Lauren Freeman. Oh, so interesting, uh, Deshondra, that uh, all of a sudden they go, uh, what? Election fraud? You know, Republicans have been running around and trying to pretend that in-person absentee voting is a problem. We know it's rare. You know, someone's more likely to go to the check cashing place and pretend to be Deshaun Jefferson than to go to my polling place right. in Prince William County, Virginia, and cast a ballot in, you know, my name. Voter participation in this country is already so low. But Republicans, you know, if you can't win, cheat. And that's what they've been trying to do. Joe, what's stunning here is you have Mark Harris, who lied on the stand, got busted by his own son. Now he's mm -hmm. sick and he can't run. No, his ass needs to be indicted. Well, imagine if the decision had gone the other way. He would have been standing in Washington, D.C. next to yep. Pelosi right now. Boom. Not saying, well, I can't do this, that's Nancy. Right. I'm sick. Yeah. And so that's this right. is so, I mean, you know, I know you're unfiltered and so am I on my show. But go ahead. <laughs> I, I don't have a cussing jar. <laughs> Hold on. Ain't no cussing jar here, See, Joe. I, I have, he what he's laughing about. I have a swear jar. So every time I say a curse, well, I put a dollar in. But I do donate that money. Gotcha. Uh, to, but this, but you can cuss here. They ain't going to cost you. But it is ridiculous, <laughs> man. I mean, it, and, and you, you're right. You said it all. Mm -hmm. You've said it best. It's, it, and, and Republicans, that's the that's how they win. They have to cheat yeah. in these, especially in these districts where you know it's it's borderline. Yeah, voter ID. Go ahead. I was gonna say real quickly. Voter ID is a new literacy tax. Okay, yeah. that's a new yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. I was gonna say not only do they have to cheat, they have to lie about the cheating. So they're trying mm -hmm. to convince and tell folks, hey, there's some makeup stories of people cheating so that they can create new policies and laws yeah. to continue to disenfranchise people yeah. of color from actually accessing the polls and getting to the yeah. polls in the first you know, place. This last election, there were a hell of problems with absentee voting, right. and now they're continuing to push those po policies back. Uh, all right, folks, let's talk about Virginia. Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax got some good news, some pollings out this week. For the first time in three weeks since allegations of sexual misconduct surfaced, more Virginians want him to remain in office than resign. According to a Roanoke College poll yesterday, 40% say Fairfax should remain, 31% say he should resign, 29% uh, had no opinion. Uh, you still have Republicans there, uh, Tiffany, who want there to be uh, hearings to impeach him. He keeps saying, hey, I want a law enforcement investigation. Yeah. I'm still baffled that the Suffolk County District Attorney in Boston has said, if Professor Vanessa Tyson mm -hmm. files a complaint, I will investigate. Right. Her lawyers announced she's going to meet with the DA. That was been almost a couple of weeks now, but they haven't said they're going to actually file. I I'm still just trying to understand how you're open to speaking at an impeachment hearing, but you won't file a, a criminal complaint with the DA who has the authority to investigate. Right, which then has the authority to investigate and then make a decision and go to trial about it. So this, it's really, really fishy. I'm not trying to, under, I don't really understand why that's happening and we won't find out until later, I'm sure. But the polls speak power to what's going on and what they want to see. Uh, Deshaun, we'll go to you. Again, this is the issue I have. Look, I believe if a woman says I was sexually assaulted, I want, the, I want a full investigation. Mm -hmm. A DA is saying... I am ready to investigate, but you got to file a complaint. And she's not doing mm -hmm. it. It hasn't happened. No. And you know what? I, again, I, now I live in Virginia, okay? Now let me pull out the Virginia ties. I'm a member of the um, DPVA Central Committee. And what is I mean, that? This, Central Committee, we're like no, the voting DPVA, what is that? Oh, Democratic Party of Virginia. Go ahead. Go you know, go. I got to say this. My kid and I, we were out campaigning for Northam. We were out campaigning for Harris. You know, um, we were out campaigning for Justin Fairfax. Okay, so we were out there. This for me is personal. These are people that I've gone out there for, that I've campaigned for, that I want to see in office. You know, and I take a lot of black folks, we take this personally because we're feeling that we're being attacked. Let's talk about Northam. If you want to have a real conversation, let's keep the focus on that, him being in blackface and then the next day denying he was even in that photo. Joe. Well, I, I, I tread lightly with this only because uh, in my household, the, the, the women and the young girls are watching this very carefully, and they're watching their dad and their grandfather. I'm like you. I think whenever an accusation is made, 
you better take it seriously. But I am also on your side that if this is real and you've got a prosecutor in Massachusetts that says there is no statute of limitation, and that's the, the main concern, right. then you really should want to get to the bottom of it. You really should want an investigation. But they ain't got yeah. and, and because what the Republicans are trying to do here. Really, they're not, they're not that concerned about you know. these two African-American women. No, they, they want to cut their head off oh, yeah. the yeah. entire Democratic that's, leadership. That's exactly right. But I got to stay with Scott Virginia. Go to, uh, y'all, go, go to my iPad. This is from the Washington Post. Virginia first lady under fire for handing cotton mm -hmm. to African-American students on mansion tour. The lead says a Virginia state employee has complained that her eighth grade daughter was upset during a tour of the historic governor's residence when First Lady Pam Northam handed raw cotton to her and another African-American child and asked them to imagine being enslaved and having to pick the crop. White people don't get to try to train black people on how to be enslaved or to think about the history during Black History Month. What is going on? Where, where, Amanda Seals in her stand-up comedy said the caucasity. <clears throat> and when I saw this, I said the caucasity of this woman to pass cotton to children, shout out to the uh, eighth graders who actually stood up and said something about this in the first place, it, it is baffling to me. And white people are wrong. Just you are so not allowed to do blackface. You can't pass cotton to kids. You can't say that you uh, are a racist when you are a racist. And you can't parade and use black women as, as props. This Just, whole month has been crazy. Deshonda, Northern's office and, and one other parent of a child who was present said the first lady did not single out the African American students and simply handed out the cotton to a group. <laughs> Look at your face. You don't even believe I mean, this, like, Roland. You don't even believe this is right, Roland. Wait, wait, wait. Her husband, again, I want to go back to the black. Her husband was in blackface or a clan. There's a photo of him in a yearbook, and they turn around and they're in the blackface or in a clan role. We don't know which one yet. He's he was, in the picture. Well, he's in the picture. Yeah, he's, he's not in, in the, the picture. picture. Whatever, the changing story. They are not sensitive to the black community, which helped them get elected in the first place. No, Joe, I, don't Joe, Joe, Joe. I don't think that they respect the black community. I, re I really don't think that they care. Joe. I don't think they're sensitive. I think they're disrespectful. That's Joe, it. isn't a good idea. White folks, don't even hand me a cotton swab. Just don't. I, I, I had somebody on my show who said they don't even like to touch the cotton in an aspirin bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that sad? I mean, but but look, let, let's just be understand. It's it's ignorance. If you're gonna if you're gonna talk about cotton, talk about the, the you know the the invention of the cotton gin, how it changed the entire country, not just in Virginia, the South, but the reality. It was transcontinental. It, it, in fact, it took on, banks made money off of it. Right. Teach the young people the history. Teach them the young history, the, the, teach young people the history of King Cotton and how even King Cotton was part of the West, the March West with Native Americans that they stripped I their land. The, wait, teach, I want someone teach, to teach the Northams about white no, fragility. Hey, screw, I almost got a dollar in this way, Joe. Go ahead, screw, Joe. No, screw the Northams. You guys keep worrying about them. Screw them. The reality is teach these kids their history. The Northams are stupid. Can I go they're one step further? Power. Let me but go one step further. They're, Sir, there are stupid I, people in they power. Are facts. They are. You Absolutely. got a president they racist people in power. Go ahead. I would say, yes, the education piece, but pass all of that. I just need white people to apologize and offer reparations. Oh, well, Period. Yeah, well. I want money for when you do stupid things like this, I want you to pay. So, I, so, so what you're saying is, to to so Joe that. got a swear jar. You want a crazy white jar. I want a crazy white jar. Okay, when so this, so this, crazy, so this, give black people money. So, so this, this gonna work for this next story, y'all. This is my last one before we gotta go. Uh, y'all know we always profile crazy ass white women. Okay? We got a crazy ass white woman in Maryland. Her name is Mary Ann Lasanti. She described a legislative district in Prince George's County as an inward district. At first, she said she couldn't remember saying it. But when the Washington mm. Post, asked her if she had ever used the word, this is what she said. I'm sure I have. I'm sure everyone has used it. I've used the F word. I use the lowest name in vain. Um, mm. what, 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 what y'all? Well, hold on. You, you, left, you left one other thing out. She said it, it wasn't, <laughs> this was the one, it wasn't in her vocabulary. Right. That's right. She said it, right. it was not in my vocabulary, right. but it came out my it mouth. It came out my mouth. Y'all, you know? she's been stripped of her subcommittee chairmanship yeah. and will undergo sensitivity training. 
Yeah. He's apologized, but today key Maryland elected officials, including the Black Legislative Caucus, Governor Larry Hogan, a Republican, and Prince George's County Executive Angela Allsbrook, no. a Democrat, have called on her to resign. And also the Maryland State Conference of the NAACP has also called for her to resign. We need the ultimate black clapback. When you do something stupid, racist, ignorant like this, Step out of your position, resign, and then also pay us some money. I thought we had. I thought we had this, but y'all go ahead and play it. I forgot they, they they were supposed to tell me we had this. Hit play. No charcoal girls are alive. I'm white. I got you. Huh? Um, illegally selling water without a permit on my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey! Give me your ass. We don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. Y'all have got Y'all have got to remember to put that in the doggone script. No, crazy ass white. Yeah, crazy ass white. You need to add the Houston woman who got mad at the couple. It, it's so many crazy ass white women. We can't you add. Got, you need a uh, uh, Otherwise, the video going <laughs> to be about 15 minutes long. Longer than that. J Joe, go ahead. Well, no, I wanted to get back to one thing about Amber Lynn, and I thank you so much for Amber Evans. Amber, Amber, Amber yeah, Evans, go ahead. because I was here when you when you first broke that, and we started on our show. All right. And 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 I'm going to say something. You know, every it, it, for G CNN and MSNBC and all the networks ought to be ashamed of themselves. Mm -hmm. And the black folk who work for them ought to be ashamed of themselves. Because I remember when this white, young, white college student in Iowa was missing. Yep. Her image oh, yeah. was all yeah. over the country. And we have to demand this. But also, we have the responsibility. We can't wait on these networks Absolutely. to do that. We have the, we have the ability in our pocket with these phones. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this is what we ought to be tweeting about. Mm -hmm. This is what we ought to be talking about. There's more information about R. Kelly and his dumb ass mm. than, there are, than there is about a Amber Evans. Yep. She's out there somewhere, right. and it's up to us to, to take care. Cause it, right. it, and, and, and so it's on us, too. Absolutely. And I want to thank you, Roland, uh, for, for, for bringing this to our yeah. attention. Oh and any other brother or sister that's got a show or a podcast, get serious. That's right. right. Black Lives Matter. Use it. And look, I made the point that, look, there, uh, and I tweeted this uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, that if you take the eight cable networks that target black people, yeah. that, that either black own or target black people, combined, they do 1,344 hours of television a week. And out of those 1,344, there is not a single hour dedicated to a news show. Mm -hmm. yeah. I keep saying black folk that we are entertaining ourselves, laughing ourselves That's to right. death. We, you gotta have, we call you gotta have a place for Tanya, yeah. that girl's mama, to be That's able to right. call That's right. and say, "Do so, and I'm gonna keep tell the you, thing on my gonna, daughter." She's gonna be on my show if I can before go. the week is out, Good. and we're gonna repeat it. But it's this thing called. It's, they, they call it infotainment. Yep. Yeah. In other words, the information has to be presented in an entertaining way. Right. And it's got us all screwed up because there's nothing entertaining about a missing young woman right. who is out there. Because if that was your daughter or your oh, sister that's, that's or your exactly niece, exactly right. you want somebody to talk about the story Absolutely. as well. Or my neighbor. That's right. <laughs> final, final thoughts. Deshondra, I'm going to start with you. Whatever you want to say. It. All right. You know what? When we were talking about that Maryland legislator, you know, we have to demand better. I want to say that for Virginia, we've got to demand better of our elected officials. You know, I'm sorry. It does matter that Northam is still governor in blackface and his wife thinks it's OK to hand out cotton balls to kids who are visiting the governor's mansion. For me, that's offensive. Yeah. But we can't get past it if we don't call it out and if we don't demand better. Joe? Well, I, I, I do want to give Elijah Cummings credit. He ran one hell of a committee meeting. Now, and, and he's been waiting six, eight years to mm -hmm. be in that position. And the, the, what I love more than anything else is when he turned to his fellow congressman. Jim Jordan. And, and not to Jim Jordan, the other uh, one. Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows. And said, I'm the chairman. Yeah. This is my, I have the power. I want folks to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. He's, and I, so I, I, give, I give Elijah Cummings credit. He ran a... In, in, he ran a hell of a committee uh, hearing. 
Tiffany. I'll just say two things. One, I agree with that. Um, one is it always matters who we elect, and this is why. We saw it today in mm -hmm. all these stories. That's right. It That's matters right. who you choose in elections. We saw the mayor race in Chicago. We got elections coming up for gubernatorial races in Louisiana, Kentucky, and in Mississippi this year. DA races, local races. Every race matters. And two, every election race matters. And two, it is really, really important that we figure out the campaign to get white people to pay when they do something effed up like all the things that we saw during Black History Month this year. I want white people to pay for their actions, and we have to figure out that campaign. Now, Roland, what's her title? National <laughs> College Director. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah that, that, that long. That, 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 that long, that long two-sided business card Put title. Put some respect on my name. <laughs> Boy, because it, it takes about 20 minutes to go through all your titles. <laughs> all right, y'all, so here's my final comments. I, you heard me talk about uh, uh, what we have here. Here's the reality. I just want y'all to understand. I know it's a whole bunch of other people out there, you know, and they, they pull up their laptop and they talk on YouTube. But here's the reality. This is the only news show that's a digital show targeting black people. And you got to understand this, and I'm going to just keep saying it. We got to fund our freedom. That black mama, CNN, has not called her. That's right. Mm -hmm. MSNBC has not called Tanya. Fox News has not called her, ABC, CBS, NBC. So when are we going to put our money where our mouth is and support shows that matter? Now, I'm going to just be honest with y'all. When TV One ended my show, there were people, they, they still hit me up. Man, we would love for you to go back to CNN, love for you to go back to MSNBC, but let me help y'all out. If I had a show on one of those networks and that sister emailed me, I would have to ask somebody else, can we put her on the show? And somebody else would say, we think that there are other stories that are more important. Y'all, I'm a grown ass man, I'm 50. I run three black newspapers, a black website, news editor for a black magazine. I'm not interested in asking somebody white, can I? I'm just being straight up, I'm not. I'm not interested in basically asking pretty much white men who run media, can I please go report on black people? I'm just not. And so it's a personal sacrifice saying we're going to launch this show and do all the stuff that we're doing. But I'll tell you what, I'll put this show up against anything else out there where all they doing is talking about Trump and his latest damn tweet all day. Uh -huh. The reality is we need your support to actually make this happen. Because I'll be honest, if you don't support it, this show goes away. I appreciate Ford Cares being one of our partners. I appreciate D. Herbs. I appreciate Bishop T.D. Jakes uh, and his Pastors and Leadership Conference. But the reality is your dollars also make this thing go. And so I want you to go to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You, uh, you can do a, a, a monthly give, a yearly give. You know, our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans to give an average of 50 bucks each. Joe has already given his 100 bucks. Uh, to make this thing happen. This is about us controlling our own destiny. So I want you to go to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Right now, I'm looking. It's 1,148 of you watching on YouTube as we speak. If I go over here uh, to Periscope, and see, I'm going to go ahead and call y'all out. Uh, if if the, all the folks on YouTube watching gave, you literally will double the number of people who've actually given uh, thus far. If I go to Periscope right now, uh, there are more than uh, about 100 folks who are watching on Periscope. We had about 600 early on Facebook. The point I'm making is this here. I'm tired of asking somebody else to tell our story. We must control our narrative. So go to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Tomorrow on the show, folks, we're going to talk about the amount of money, $23 billion more that has gone to white schools versus black schools. It's not like we didn't know that. We'll talk about the impact and what that has on our children. So we'll see you guys tomorrow right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Holla!
you want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Okay.